The information contained in this podcast is for general information purposes and does not constitute investment advice. You should seek investment advice tailored to your circumstances before making an investment decision. This is In The Know, a monthly investment podcast brought to you by Magellan Asset Management, experts in global investing. We bring you timely, unique and thought-provoking insights to help you make sense of today's investment landscape. What we do know is that none of the former president Hu Jintao's protégés made it into the Politburo. They're probably the three most economically literate or credentialed or well-known, at least to Western investors, figures that were expected to be in the leadership lineup. With all of them gone, that means that leaves a hole where market-oriented economic credibility used to be. That's John Garneau, founder of investment advisory firm Garneau Global, explaining how the changes to the Chinese leadership will undoubtedly have a big impact on the country's attitudes to growth and foreign investment. Welcome to Magellan in the Know. In this episode, John Garneau is joined by Matt Pottinger, a distinguished visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution, to discuss Chinese President Xi Jinping's tightening grip on power, his recent meetings with fellow leaders Joe Biden and Anthony Albanese, as well as growing restrictions on technology exports to China. They're speaking with Magellan Head of Macro and Portfolio Manager Arvid Strymon and Magellan Investment Analyst Adrian Liu in a compelling discussion about the implications for investors of these important developments. But first, a warm welcome from Arvid Strymon. Welcome to our podcast, Magellan in the Know. I'm Arvid Strymon, Portfolio Manager and Head of Macro here at Magellan, and today I'm joined again by my colleague and technology analyst, Adrian Liu. Adrian, great to have you back. Thanks, Arvid. Great to be here as always. And we're also lucky to have with us today two leading voices on understanding China, which should help investors navigate the China investment landscape. The first guest is John Garneau. Now, John is the founder of an investment advisory firm, Garneau Global. He's also a senior fellow at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. He led the Australian government's analysis and policy response to authoritarian interference as a principal advisor to the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet from 2016 to 17. And he was previously Fairfax's China correspondent from 2007 to 13 before he joined Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull's team in 2015. So welcome, John. Thank you, Arvid. Good to be here. And we also have Matt Pottinger. Matt is a distinguished visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution, which is at Stanford University. And he most recently served for four years in senior roles in the US government. And that was at the National Security Council. And that also included a stint as Deputy National Security Advisor between 2019 and 2021. So welcome, Matt, too. Hey, Arvid and Adrian, it's great to be with you. And it's great to have both of you here. Now, I think what we should talk about today are some key issues for investors when it comes to China. And the first one is, what is the impact of the recent National Party Congress? Secondly, how decoupling between China and, quite frankly, most of the rest of the world might play out? And thirdly, what is the outlook for China's zero COVID policy? And perhaps where we'll start is on the National Party Congress, which recently wound up. And John, I've got a question for you. It was the 20th National Party Congress. Xi Jinping formally received his third term as leader. And what was really interesting, I think, from an investment perspective, was that this all happened, or at least the last part happened, over the weekend and on the following Monday in Hong Kong, the local stock market index, the Hang Seng, fell over 6%. And when we see big moves such as that, it usually means that something unexpected has happened. So, John, in your view, what were the main outcomes from that National Party Congress for investors? Yeah, thank you, Arvid. Look, the indices moved because uh, something did shake in Beijing over that weekend. In our view, the dial did move from what had been a Congress that was panning out towards the midpoint of our expectations towards something that was more extreme. And to take it through the different parts of the Congress, I think there's, there's three components to it, really. One is the General Secretary Xi Jinping's work report, which is his ostensibly a backward-looking self-appraisal of the previous five years, and not surprisingly, he gave himself some pretty good marks. 
And then the second part of it is an amendment to the party charter, the constitution. And this is what really sets the KPIs for what is now 95 million cadres and sets the the long-term parameters of policy over the following five years. And the third thing, I think this is the biggest deal, the third thing is the party congress or just after the congress is the place at which they unveil the new leadership team. And going through those three elements one by one, the work report was roughly at the midpoint of our expectations, and this is, you know, it's harsh and it's ambitious and it's very Xi Jinping-centred, but it was continuity from what we'd seen before. That's not necessarily a rosy outlook for investors, but it was uh, predictable and within expectations. On the party charter, there was something really interesting here, and that is that Xi Jinping has now introduced the word struggle into the charter in a way that there's, you know, there's almost as many mentions the word struggle and great struggle as there is opening and reform in the party charter, which shows a comprehensive rebalancing of emphasis from, you know, the old Deng Xiaoping goals of opening the economy, making a more prosperous country to an emphasis on politics. And there's no part of the Leninist, the Stalinist and the Maoist lexicon, which is uh, more resonant than the word struggle. Struggle means to define your enemies, to isolate them, and to neutralize them. It's a constant, relentless process of political struggle. So that's a big deal, seeing that written into the charter like it was. Now, I don't, some of that might have gone over the heads of, um, of investors, but the piece that really caught everyone's attention was the movements on the leadership lineup. Now, I don't know if you remember, Arvid, that footage of Hu Jintao being literally lifted out of his chair and carried off the stage. Now, as more elements of that footage came out, it's pretty clear that that was a a spontaneous eviction. And what we were seeing is a very dramatic political event. The full repercussions only became clearer the next day. And what we do know is that none of the former president Hu Jintao's protégés made it into the Politburo. Two of them were taken out of the Central Committee, even though they were within the ostensible age limits, and none of them made it to the Politburo. So that's a big deal. That's a big deal because these three Hu Jintao protégés, that's the Premier, Li Keqiang, a very senior former party secretary of Guangdong, Wang Yang, and a third, a guy who had been previously seen as a future leader, uh, Hu Chunhua, they're probably the three most economically literate or credentialed or well-known, at uh, least to Western investors, figures that were expected to be in the leadership lineup. With all of them gone, that means that leaves a hole where market-oriented economic credibility used to be. In their place was a very, very different lineup. In their place was, if you think of the Politburo, normally it's got 25 people. This time it's got 24. Makes you wonder if there wasn't a last-minute kind of eviction from that number. Of those 25, the top seven are the standing committee. That standing committee meets most regularly. The Politburo tends to meet uh, still regularly, but not as often. So Xi Jinping and six others, all six of the, the new members of the Politburo standing committee owe their careers to Xi Jinping. You know, that is probably the easiest way to kind of imagine where people's loyalties lie. These are Xi Jinping's men. That's not to say that they're without capability, without talent, but their primary characteristic is loyalty and a history of getting things done for Xi Jinping. So now we have, which is really quite unique in the modern period, a standing committee which is populated entirely of people who are instinctively and perhaps congenitally wired to getting things done for Xi Jinping. So a Politburo of political, you know, to use a a less flattering word, apparatchiks, who are going to be not only implementing Xi Jinping's edicts because, you know, they need to survive, but very good at preempting, anticipating what he wants. And so this is a, a more aggressive, a more streamlined and efficient transmission from C to policy to impact. And then the rest of the Politburo, if I can just fill out the last piece here, because I think this is the, what was most striking to us. So what I've described is significant on its own, but the rest of the Politburo, it included a new cohort of technocrats, but they weren't econocrats. They were technocrats who were trained in defence industry, space industry, and the intelligence system. We can go into more detail afterwards, but it looked to us, and certainly this, um, it looked this way to, to many investors, that she has now picked a team to match that program that it outlined of political struggle, and political struggle defined to me not only internal politics and purges, but external competition 
perhaps resilience, perhaps confrontation with the outside world. So that's why, taken all together, markets thought this is not something we can bank on. This is not a good signal for the medium or the long-term investment outlook in China. Okay, so uh, Matt, I'm going to ask you the same question, the original question, which was um, directed to John, but what did you make of the National Party Congress? Yeah, well, I mean, to fill in some other details from John's account, which I agree with completely, it's, uh, you remember that Xi Jinping has a lot of different titles, right? President, not being even one of the top two. He's also the party secretary. He's also the chairman of the Central Military Commission of the uh, Communist Party. And we learned from this party congress who his two deputies will be, the two vice chairmen of that Central Military Commission. One of them is going to be Zhang Youxia. Now, Zhang Youxia was already in the role, but Xi Jinping, interestingly, decided to retain him even though he's 72 years old. That's, you know, three or four years older than the point at which you usually have to retire rather than be elevated. And this is interesting because Xi Jinping's father had fought alongside Zhang Youxia's father in the Chinese Revolution. And so it's clearly someone that he trusts and who has already been working for years on Xi's various objectives for the military. Remember, when Xi Jinping came to power 10 years ago, a lot of people thought, gee, I wonder if he's going to be an economic reformer or maybe even a political reformer. We now know that, no, he's neither of those things, but he is a military reformer. He has purged the top ranks of the PLA. He has purged deep down into the ranks and then really reorganized the combatant commands and put an enormous emphasis on training for war, realistic training, increasingly joint types of training to make the People's Liberation Army more effective at war. So Zhang Youxia will be one of the vice chairmen. The other is a, a more junior officer who got promoted, in fact, promoted two levels in order to become the other vice chair. And his name is He Weidong. He's 65 years old, is someone who's really been focused on improving joint operations in the PLA. And then also notably, he was the commander of the ground forces in the Western Theater Command during the bloody confrontation with Indian soldiers in the summer of 2020 as uh, China was making deliberate and coordinated incursions into those areas that are contested between India and China. And then after he was in that role, he was sent to the Eastern Theater to lead the Eastern Theater, which has responsibility for Taiwan. And he was in that role when China launched missiles over Taipei for the first time and missiles into Japan's exclusive economic zone and ran a, a dress rehearsal for a blockade just this past summer in August following the visit to Taiwan by the, the U.S. Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. So that, that gives you a little bit more color on the personnel picture. Okay, great. So um, a couple of things that you touched on, which we'll talk about later on, um, particularly with regards to Taiwan. But John, I just wanted to flick back to you. When we're thinking about China, there's all sorts of risks that investors can face. You can face regulatory risk, you can face political risk and geopolitical risk. But I think most people think about China in terms of economic risk, and maybe that's a positive risk, okay? So maybe we think that China's going to grow, so we're interested in what's going to happen with Chinese growth. So in the past decade, China's real GDP growth has slowed from, let's call it around 8% to something like 3% this year, which so it's a bit of a slowdown. And we know that in China, which is very similar to other countries, there's a kind of a deal where politicians get to stay in power so long as they keep the economy strong. So I wonder whether, in your mind, there was anything that came out of the National Party Congress which suggested more focus from the Chinese authorities on supporting growth. Good question, Arvid. And um, if we could break that down, you know, one, it's never been entirely clear what the foundation is for this, you know, the compact that people talk about between the Chinese people and the system, because it also occurs to me that if they didn't like the growth figures, there's not much that they can really do about it. But nevertheless, it's been clear that successive Chinese leaderships have uh, placed it a high value on high growth, no question about that. And something changed under Xi Jinping where growth is no longer the priority 
He has shown himself to be more interested in what he can do with the economy, the way that he can harness capital for, particularly for state objectives, than just the fact of growth of itself. What came out of the Congress, there was not much that we could see anywhere in any of the Congress documents which were supportive of a new emphasis on economic growth. But that said, there's been some really significant moves since. I don't know if you want to jump to that now, but we are watching very closely some of the things that are happening on a bunch of policy fronts, particularly on the Zero COVID policy program. Matt, we were talking earlier about um, the military side and when we were talking about China and military, the conversation inevitably goes to Taiwan. Um, So was there anything in China's language or perhaps even signalling towards Taiwan? Um, I know that some folks in the US have been talking about a window for a Chinese invasion later this decade of Taiwan as some of their military power increases relative to America's in in that theatre. And the President Xi and Biden meeting on the sidelines of the recent G20, Xi publicly called out Taiwan as a red line issue for China. So I guess there are a couple of questions there. Number one for you, Matt, were there any changes in language by China towards Taiwan in the NPC? And secondly, do you think there really is a window of opportunity for Taiwan when it comes to China uh, potentially taking a closer look at the island later this decade? Well, let's back up for a moment and look at the ways that Xi Jinping has been talking about Taiwan during his first decade as dictator, because there's already a departure in the rhetoric as compared with his predecessors. You remember that Deng Xiaoping famously said on at least one occasion that if we have to wait a thousand years to unify Taiwan, uh, we can wait, but Deng reserved the right to use force if Taiwan declared independence. That was more or less the same rhetorical sort of bumper sticker for things that followed, the idea that Taiwan could be attacked if it sought independence. Xi Jinping changed the rhetoric to talk early on in his tenure and then repeatedly after about how he does not want to pass on this unresolved question, Taiwan question, from generation to generation any any longer. He also talked about in a couple of speeches, he has said that a failure to unify Taiwan would in essence mean the failure of his broader signature legacy policy, which is the Chinese dream for the great rejuvenation of the Chinese people. And so he has said that without Taiwan unified, that that Chinese dream cannot be realized. So he set a bar for failure for himself that he, uh, I think, is intent on surmounting. Now, what did he say in this event? Well, he said in the work report at the beginning of the uh, party congress that resolving the Taiwan question and realizing China's complete unification is for the party a historic mission and an unshakable commitment. He said that we will never promise to give up the use of force and reserve the option of taking all necessary measures This is aimed at the interference of external forces and the very few Taiwan independent separatists and their separatist activities. So he didn't put a timeline on when he must achieve unification. There wasn't anything that went dramatically beyond what he'd already been saying, but the changes that have occurred since he first came to power have been dramatic enough already. There's a change in the general approach which had been to preserve the status quo and threaten the use of force in order to preserve the status quo from an independent Taiwan to now threatening the use of force in order to compel a proactive movement by Taiwan towards unification with the mainland. So yeah, you know, your question, is there a window? I think that it would be prudent to assume that this is something that Xi Jinping intends to handle on his watch to resolve, as he puts it, the Taiwan question. He's just given himself roughly another decade in power. He's just given himself a third five-year term, but he didn't elevate anyone who would appear to be a future successor to him, which suggests to me that he's probably just given himself another 10 years and maybe longer. 
so we're really, we're on the actuarial table for Xi Jinping now, right? This is something that he wants to get done in his lifetime. I think it'd be prudent to assume that that's the case. And then you have to start looking at things like what capabilities he's brought to bear, what capabilities he still believes he needs. And is Taiwan, the United States, Japan, and others, are they beginning to bring new capabilities to bear that would complicate Beijing's war plans? And I think that there is an argument that could be made that we're looking at a very dangerous decade and that the front half of the decade or the next, you call it four or five years, may be even more dangerous than uh, than the tail end of that decade because she could perceive that things will begin to get harder the longer he waits after new capabilities begin to get fielded in Taiwan, anti-ship missiles and the like. And John, why don't we expand on Matt's comments here? And Matt, definitely feel free to chime in here as well on your comments about reunification. There's this popular belief that global dependency on Taiwan for chips provides some sort of protection from China, this notion of a silicon shield, so to speak. How much do you think Taiwan's position in the semiconductor supply chain actually factors into China's calculus of a forced reunification? And how do the recent US export controls on advanced chip technologies actually change the equation, if at all? Look, great questions. Look, I actually think Matt's the, um, the world expert on this set of questions, but let me give you my short answer. And the short answer is I don't believe there is a silicon shield. And I second that view. I mean, if we look for any evidence in Chinese propaganda or in official statements that have been made, we can find no evidence that Beijing is uh, concerned that a war would disrupt its own economy, even though it would. We see little sign that it's worried that about a disruption of the broader global economy. In fact, we've seen some propaganda that suggests the opposite. Rather dangerously, we've seen some very strange assumptions made by uh, vocal Chinese scholars and others who have written or given jingoistic speeches in which they've said, actually, it's something that should be a reason why we ought to invade, because we would then gain control of the world's most important semiconductor manufacturing company, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corp, TSMC. In fact, if China were to invade Taiwan, that would be the end of TSMC's ability to make high-end chips because it is so reliant on outside inputs from the United States and Japan and the Netherlands and other countries. Things would grind to a halt rather rapidly. So there is no such thing as taking control of TSMC and inheriting that capability. It would really be the end of that capability, but that's not how it's spoken about in jingoistic publications and speeches by Chinese professors who actually list it as a, uh, an attraction, the idea of war. That makes complete sense. And Matt, you talked about Dung's philosophy of, of biding your time. Do you think there's any remnant of that philosophy today when it comes to semiconductors in terms of maybe waiting until they've acquired or developed a, a minimum level of ability or threshold in terms of being self-sufficient before deciding to actually pull the trigger on anything? Yeah, you know, it is something that Xi Jinping has been rather explicit about in uh, the 14th five-year plan in uh, early 2021 and some of the speeches that he gave in 2020 leading up to that. He has identified semiconductors as one of the key areas where he wants China to achieve self-sufficiency in both the design and manufacture of chips. That's why he's bulldozing literally hundreds of billions of U.S. dollars into uh, fab capacity. The U.S. and its allies are now taking reactive steps to try to prevent China from achieving uh, self-sufficiency, mainly because she has been rather explicit that he wants to use that future self-sufficiency in order to attain coercive leverage over high-tech economies, the industrialized economies of the world. And so the U.S. is now rather intent. The Biden administration has taken some significant steps to try to prevent China from achieving that self-sufficiency. So that is um, an area that I think would not necessarily prevent or deter China from taking military action against Taiwan, but it is a complicating factor. Right. And as we look at some of the recent actions that have been taken, particularly the additional export controls that were published 
by the US Commerce Department. And it seemed to me, looking at that document, to be a reasonable amount of ambiguity in there, be it intentional or otherwise. And then others which seemed like they could have been really, really specific and, and targeted. How much do you think the, the Biden administration actually consult with industry about these rules? And do you think they adequately considered uh, the second order implications and beyond? Or was this something that was just hastily thrown together to, to get something happening? Yeah, I don't think it was hasty at all. I think that there was an intention going back to the earliest days of the Biden administration, but the, the industry is a powerful lobby. I think that the administration, the Commerce Department, uh, the White House, and other parts of the U.S. government have gotten an earful for months and months and months on this question and decided to move forward with uh, some significant export controls in spite of the wishes of some parts of the U.S. semiconductor industry. By the way, it's a very complicated, uh, it's not a monolithic thing because you have you have American companies that make the leading software for designing equipment. You have tool-making firms, applied materials, and LAM that like to export their wares to any country that wants to build new fabs, including China. But then you also have companies that make chips in the United States and, and would benefit from a bit more an effort to prevent China from becoming a low-cost, near-monopoly manufacturer of legacy logic chips and the like. So it's a complicated picture. I think that the administration heard from all comers ad nauseum, but decided that this was in the strategic interest of the U.S. and its allies. If you look at the speech, I believe it was in September, that the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan delivered, he said, look, it's no longer enough for us just to be have a relative lead on ahead of China on semiconductor technology. We actually have to increase that lead as much as possible. And the implication there is that the U.S. has to take steps not only to improve its own capabilities and to invest and even subsidize fab capacity in the United States, but also needs to take some steps to slow down China's ambitions because those ambitions are predatory. They are not commercial. They are very much geostrategic in nature. We know that because we've heard it straight from Xi Jinping's lips. And those restrictions, the wording of the controls was very much focused on the national security of the United States. To what extent do you think there was also an element of protecting either U.S. technology, protecting U.S. onshoring of manufacturing capacity, and it being more about economic considerations as much as it was about national security. And I guess, where do we go from here? You know, how does the, the Biden administration assess whether these controls achieve their objective? What are they looking out for? What are the uh, milestones here? And do you think there's more restrictions to come, whether it's in semiconductors or, or other industries? I think these objectives are squarely in the national security interest. We're not so concerned that China was going to overtake the U.S. in design or in even the level or generation of chips that China would be able to make. This was more about preventing China from becoming a monopoly provider of fairly advanced chips, not necessarily the most cutting edge. And so I think the test for the success of these measures will be less in the restrictions on chip exports to China, because that is a very difficult and sort of fraught mission to try to prevent some Chinese end users like PLA-affiliated companies that make weapon systems or that make supercomputers to test atom bombs and, and the like. You know, preventing China from obtaining chips on the market and from shifting those chips to where there is a military need is a very tricky difficult endeavor. The more important piece of, of those October 7 semiconductor rules were the part that are designed not to prevent China from obtaining chips, but to prevent China from becoming the lead manufacturer of chips. And I think that those will hit their mark. I think it will slow China down, and that will be the true measure of success of these, uh, of these semiconductor rules. And John, in considering all of this, China's been fairly uh, muted in its response to all of these restrictions. Where do you think the red lines are for China here as far as how much further the United States could push this? Why do you think they've been fairly low key in terms of a response so far? Has it just been the National Party Congress keeping, you know, sort of taking up the time of the party? And where do you see areas that China could retaliate in the meantime? 
Yeah, thanks, Adrian. Look, we didn't expect China to retaliate directly against the United States, and that's because there's no real precedent for them doing that. It's, we've had a you know, very close look, including back to the time when, when Matt was Deputy National Security Advisor in the previous administration, where there was no direct and commensurate response to actions from Washington that looked like they would be perceived as being provocative. There's lots of noise. There's lots of English language fury in the Twitter sphere. And there was a bit of uh, foreign ministry kind of um, angry talk. But in terms of substantive policy reaction, it's never been directly retaliated against US interests. It's more been following, I guess, the almost the Maoist precept of guerrilla warfare. The enemy advances, we retreat, and the enemy retreats, we harass. And so far, that pattern is playing out with respect to the United States. Now, this is not necessarily always going to be the case. Up until now, we've seen Beijing exercise, I guess, a degree of respect and restraint against the United States, and they've been much more likely to be aggressive at times when the United States might not be frontally looking at them. Or it tends to be asymmetric. China has been much more willing to retaliate sideways against allies, partners, for example. And we really expect this to broadly hold that when the United States is in a mode which China perceives to be aggressive, that is unlikely to be the time when China responds directly to it. They will bide their time. They will look for a moment that they perceive to be a vulnerability or just as likely they'll kick sideways to others. And so far that pattern is holding. That's broadly how I expect it to hold at the moment. I don't expect China to retaliate against these measures or future measures. However, China will always be searching for rationales or even pretexts to explain its own actions that are perceived to be aggressive. So the story will always be, this is just about defending China's interests. This is because of what the United States did before. But actually, in reality, I don't think the response reaction function is like that at all. Hey, John, I just wanted to get back to something that we were talking about earlier when we were talking about the economy, and you mentioned something along the lines of a zero-COVID strategy. And, you know, I, I'm a little bit confused about the zero-COVID strategy. I, on the one hand, I'm I'm pretty sure you can't keep 1.4 billion people locked up forever. But on the other hand, I'm not sure how they're going to unwind that policy in a smooth fashion. I know everyone's sort of talking about this, but, you know, in the lead up to the National Party Congress, the official Chinese media made some statements suggesting that that policy was not going to change. But right after the National Party Congress, there were whispers that it was about to be eased. And then right after that, some government officials came out and said, more or less, we're pouring cold water on those rumours. So it does seem as though China is reducing some of its restrictions, particularly those on inbound passengers into the country. But, um, you know, it is still confusing as to what the ultimate intention here is, at least in the, I guess, more so in the short term. So what's your take on the Chinese government and the zero COVID policy in the short to medium term? Look, this has been fascinating to watch and it is confusing and contradictory, but I think that the trajectory is clear. On the one hand, because the zero COVID policy comes from Xi Jinping himself, and Xi Jinping is really the definition of truth, it can't be wrong. It has to hold. So there's been no deviation from the rhetorical commitment to zero COVID, and that's likely to stay for the foreseeable future. At the same time, you know, we were watching this, and, and, uh, and we've been talking about this before, Arvid, we've been watching a couple of things happen since the Congress, which have been really striking. One, we've been watching how the propaganda has morphed, has mutated, so it's no longer talking about how catastrophic the virus is. It's been downplaying the impact of the virus. In some cases, it's more like the common cold. You know, that's significant. Two, we've seen the construction of really large, uh, what has been termed as sort of hospital care, you know, whether it actually rises to the level of hospital care or not, but they're creating beds for what looks like the preparation for mass outbreaks. Three, we're actually watching a systematic dismantling of the testing system, whereas before it was all emphasis on being able to find the virus, test for the virus, and shut it down and lock it down wherever you can. They're actually dismantling that early warning system. So by design, they're letting it through. And most importantly, they have shifted in their messaging, shifted the KPIs of officials, whereas before, an official, it was really easy. You knew that as long as you were hard, hard on the you know, on the side of lockdowns, you were going to be safe. If COVID got out in your watch, you're going to be in trouble. That has now flipped. 
it's not clear that you're safe if COVID gets out, but you're definitely no longer safe by erring on the side of lockdown. So we're seeing officials being punished and a lot of rhetoric about officials being out of line for being too aggressive on lockdowns. And all of that adds up to, at best, policy confusion. And we're still seeing commitments to lockdown, but with a lag and not the same sort of forward, ruthless, eradicated at all costs. And so what this means, and we've been describing in our client notes for the last three weeks, Arvid, is we're seeing an attempt to implement what we call the controlled burn of Omicron through society. They would prefer it doesn't engulf the country all at once, like every country has you know, tried to smooth the peaks of Omicron so that the public health system is not overwhelmed. And China is particularly vulnerable because it's got an under-vaccinated population, particularly elderly population, and its vaccines are particularly effective. So it definitely attempts to slow it down. And there's lockdowns now in major cities at the moment, including Beijing and Guangzhou and Shenzhen and Shijiaduang. But this is not the same as trying to actually implement zero COVID like they were before. So we think the direction is controlled burn throughout the Chinese economy and society, which would take months, it will take longer than it has you know, in, in the West. But nevertheless, it's happening. So now we can see a post-lockdown you know, a possibility for China at some point, you know, perhaps in the first half of next year, whereas before we couldn't see that at all. So everything's changed, even though the commitment to the headline policy remains unchanged. Yeah, they're moving from containment to mitigation, to use the public health parlance, even though that may not be how they're describing it. But that's effectively what's happening now. They're moving from zero COVID to what you could call a zero COVID deaths strategy. And um, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's only been a few deaths in, <laughs> reported in China in spite of tens of thousands of uh, new cases each day. Miraculously, uh, no one's actually dying of it. So what's happening here is they're simply not reporting COVID deaths as COVID deaths. They're attributing the cause of death to anything but COVID. And that's been a feature of this pandemic in China since its earliest days. Okay, now I know we're getting towards the end of our little discussion here, but um, I just wanted to throw in one last thing here, which is, um, and it's a really a question to both of you, and perhaps we can spill out the question, but um, as mentioned earlier, Xi Jinping and Joe Biden met on the sidelines of the G20 summit, and our very own Prime Minister Albanese also met with Xi Jinping, um, which I think was their first official face-to-face meeting between a Prime Minister of Australia and the um, leader of China since 2016. So I wanted to get both of your takeaways on those meetings, and perhaps the best way to divvy this up is, Matt, if you provided your takeaway on the Xi Jinping-Biden meeting, and, and John, if you could perhaps give your thoughts on what the implications of this re-engagement between the two leaders of Australia and China are. Sure. Well, look, it's good that the two leaders are talking because Xi Jinping is the only one who makes decisions in that system, increasingly so. And so it's important that you have that high-level diplomacy taking place. There's no substitute for the two leaders uh, speaking to one another. My interpretation is that Xi Jinping's goals are contained in the canon of speeches and work reports and amendments to the party charter that he has made up to and including just a a few weeks ago at the party congress. If we're paying attention, we should feel confident that we have a pretty good idea of what his ambitions are, the scope of those ambitions, and his means of achieving them through what he calls a spirit of struggle, struggle in the Stalinist sense of the word. So to the extent that she might be trying to turn on a little bit more charm on the international stage right now, I view as purely tactical. It might even be a, a sign of weakness within you know, his own recognition of the state of weakness that the Chinese economy is in right now. Let's face it, their economy has cratered. If they're reporting 0.4% growth in the second quarter, you can bet that it's a large uh, negative number that we've seen. So it might be from a sense of weakness, but I view it as temporary and tactical. And John, your interpretations of the Australia-China meeting? Yeah, look, I agree with all of that, which doesn't mean it's inconsequential, which doesn't mean it's unimportant. So in Australia's case, you know, perhaps less significant for the big guy on the block. For for Australia, it matters that our biggest trading partner, that every official in China is no longer incentivised to beat up on Australia. This will mean an opportunity for some relief on the export front, on the various export embargoes and blockades. That's not a prediction of you know short-term movement, but it, it opens the door 
to progress there. It opens the door to the possibility that Australian hostages will be released, particularly Yang Hong Jun, a terrific and important pro-democracy writer, Australian citizen, and also Chung Lei, the journalist, who are both detained and their fate is tied very much to the state of bilateral relations. So these are all good things because it's a window of opportunity to get important things done and unlocked. While sticking to Matt's caveat that this is not structural, this is tactical, there's a window here. It won't last forever. At the moment, it looks like Canada has taken Australia's place on the um, on the geopolitical dartboard. So it just shows that you know, all the wheel has turned. Uh, the game remains the same. And in the, you know, in the short term, this is on balance good news for Australian producers and Australia generally. Okay, great. So let's celebrate the re-engagement because I think that that you're right. As I often tell people, the worst thing that people can do is not speak to each other. But um, I think we're coming towards the end of our conversation. I just wanted to say that's been a great conversation about some things that are very big issues for investors. So thanks very much for your time, both Matt and John. Thank you, Harvard. And thank you, Adrian. What a great pleasure. Always good to talk with you. Yeah, it's great to speak with you all. Thanks, guys. That was Magellan Head of Macro and Portfolio Manager Arvid Strymon and Magellan Investment Analyst Adrian Liu, speaking with John Garneau, founder of investment advisory firm Garneau Global, and Matt Pottinger, a distinguished visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution. We trust you've enjoyed this episode of Magellan In The Know. Join us in a month's time for the next episode. For more information on upcoming episodes, visit magellangroup.com.au slash podcast, where you can also sign up to receive our regular Investment Insights program. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.